Graphs of sine and cosine functions. In previous lessons, we have talked about the parent functions of sine and cosine. We know that their period is 2 pi, the domain is all real numbers, and the range is negative 1 to positive 1. We also know that the x-intercepts of sine, so this is y is equal to sine of x on the left-hand side of your screen, the intercepts are at intervals of pi, and again, that's for the parent function. This, so this is before we do any sort of translations or shrinking or stretching or anything else. We've got 0 pi, 1 pi, 2 pi, and so on and so on to infinity. And the cosine function is the intercepts are at intervals of pi over 2. So 1 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2, obviously not 2 pi over 2. So this is pi over 2 plus pi n, where n is some integer. Which means that I'm adding pi to this. So 3 pi over 2, the next one over here would be 5 pi over 2, and so forth. So those are the intervals, I'm sorry, the intercepts. In addition, we have something that we call five key points, and we haven't talked about that yet, but there are five key points on each graph. And for sine, we have three intercepts and a minimum and a maximum. So sine, because it begins and ends on the x-axis, has three intercepts. And then the sine function goes up to a maximum of pi over 2 comma 1, and then back down to be an intercept, and then continues down to our minimum of 3 pi over 2 comma negative 1. So these are the five key points, and we're going to revisit those at the end of this lesson when we put together all of the different transformations we're going to learn about in this lesson. For cosine, because it begins on the y-intercept, so not at the x-axis, we're going to start with a maximum, and then we have an intercept at pi over 2 comma 0, and then we have a minimum of pi over 2 comma negative 1, and then back up to another intercept, and then it's back to a maximum. So because the period began with a maximum, it also ended with a maximum. So those are our two functions, and in the following pages or slides, we're going to take a look at the general function and what all of the um, transformations we can do for sine and cosine. So the general equation form for either sine or cosine functions is y is equal to d plus a and then the function sine or cosine of b times x minus c. And we're going to learn about the effects of all of the different variables um, in this lesson. So we'll begin with a. a is the amplitude. a is going to make our graph, which originally looks like this, look like this, or perhaps with a smaller altitude. Okay, the period is not going to change, just the altitude, so just the height of each curve. B is the period, that's going to increase for 0 to 1 values of B, values of the absolute value of B and decrease for b is greater than 1. And so what we mean is if our original function looks like this, if we have a period between 0 and 1, so if, I'm sorry, if b is between 0 and 1, then our period is going to get smaller. So you're going to see it look maybe like this. Or if it's greater than 1, maybe it'll look like this. So we can see it's going to either stretch out or smush together. For C, C actually doesn't do anything all by itself. Um, it's tied to B because C is going to shift our graphs right or left, but it's also going to take B into account because obviously that's going to affect the value as well. So right or left. And then the vertical shift just shifts it up or down. Uh, that's a very easy one. So up or down by the value of D. So I'm going to erase my markings because this is a really good screenshot page. And in the following pages, we're going to look at all four of these transformations. 
We're going to begin with the amplitude. So this is the parent function for sine. And notice in Desmos, I've just typed in y is equal to a sine x, and then I put a is equal to one, because if I didn't have this, Desmos wouldn't know what to do. So you have to give a a value, and you can certainly just replace a with one in the function as well. But again, this is that parent function, and this is one period, so from zero to two pi. For the amplitude, I can use a slider, and we can see as A goes up, it gets much fatter. As A goes down, it gets much skinnier. Let's kind of go this way, see how it's flatter. But I want you to note that when only the altitude is changing, you still have the same intercepts. They're not shifting right or left or up or down you st still have those same intercepts. Now this guy got a little shorter, again, which makes sense because we're changing the height. If I were to go back to one, that's the parent function. Now here I can see that it's getting bigger. And then between zero and one, it's getting flatter. But then when I flip over to the negative side, this makes sense because we know what happens when we have that negative value. It's just going to flip it over. So if I go to negative one, you can see this is just flipped over the x-axis. Originally, it started up from zero, and at pi over two, it reached one. Now I can see it went down from zero, and at pi over two, it reached negative one. So again, that's why it says the absolute value is going to change the height. Now we're going to look at the period of our function. And the period of our function is how long does it take to complete a full cycle? So here, if I start at zero, zero, I'm going up, I'm going back down, and then this is back to the beginning essentially. So our period is two pi. Now watch what happens as I make B bigger. Now if B is two, I can see that now that I've reached one pi, that's a full cycle. So from zero, it went up, intercept down, back to the beginning. So I've essentially divided by two because we're taking um, x two pi, which is our original period, and dividing by b, which is two. So again, if I divide by a value that is between zero and one, let's say I have 0.5, if I can get it there. Now I can see at two pi, I've only done half. So I'd have to come over here to four pi to have the full period, the full cycle. And again, if I make this negative, I can see exactly what would happen. Again, negative just flips it over. So again, we're concerned the negative will flip it, but it's the absolute value that's going to make it much closer together or between zero and one, make it much more spread apart. So that's going to affect the period. Now we wanna talk about a phase shift, which is basically a horizontal shift, um, but it does take B into account. But both, without looking at B, let's just look at C when the value of B is one. So when our period is still two pi, Let's look at what happens when I'm messing with C. So I can see that if I press play, it's really just taking the whole graph and going right or left with it. So if I'm shifting to the positive direction, I can see it's moving in the positive direction and vice versa, which is great. I can also now, we're going to take B into account. So we already know that B is going to affect the period, so when I, used b of 2. Now I can see that my period is different. Um, c of 0 would put it right where it's supposed to be. So now my period is pi. And again, this will still move that graph right or left. So it's not really that it's b and c working together. It's we know what b does. It smushes it together or spreads it out. And then c is going to move that spread out graph right or left. So one thing I do want to point out is with B, 
when we are shifting the period, that's going to affect the intercepts, the location of those intercepts. C is also going to affect the location of those intercepts because it's going to shift it right or left. So again, those two working together, we've got all sorts of funny stuff going on. Our last one is probably the easiest one. It's very straightforward. D is just going to move the entire graph up and down. So essentially what it does is it's going to, instead of oscillating over the X axis, which is what's happening now, it's going up and down over the X. If I make D one, now you can see it's going up and down over the line Y equals one. Or if I make it go further up, way off the graph, further down, way down, we get the idea. It's really just taking the whole thing and moving it up or down and changing the line at which our function is going to oscillate. Let's do a little bit of exploration with the five key points. Now we talked previously about the five key points for sine, and that was at the point zero, zero, which is an intercept, pi over two, one, which is a maximum, pi comma zero, which is an intercept, three pi over two comma negative one, which is a minimum, and then an intercept. Now, as you can see, I've created a table here. So before we get into this, let's make sure you know how to set up Desmos. First of all, to create a table, I just went to plus and created a table. I replaced whatever popped up here with X. And then over here, I used F of X because I have my function set up as F of X. So I wanted to make sure that the function F of X that I had typed in, which is the sine function, corresponded to this table because this is going to change based on what happens over here. Now, in terms of the five points, I wanted to make sure that the X values were calculated correctly based on the period of the function and the phase shift of the function. So notice this is the point zero, zero. So C divided by B right now is zero divided by one, which is zero. I also want to point out that if you are graphing in Desmos or trying to visualize in Desmos, if you just click the gear, I'm sorry, the wrench icon, you can for step, just type in PI for pi. And as you can see now, this is pi over two, pi three, pi over two and so forth. And you can use your fingers to pinch and zoom if you need different intervals of pi. All right, so that's the logistics of it. Now let's take a look at what happens with the five key points. So we've already looked at each of these types of things. So A and B and C and D and what they all do, but let's take a look at the five key points as well. So again, for A, I want you to notice that the X values for the five key points are not changing. They're just moving up and down. Okay, that's the minimum and maximum are moving up and down. If I switch to the negative side, as we know, it's just going to reflect over the x-axis. So that's A, let's put it back to one. B, if B has no C value, B is just changing that period. So now I can see that first point is still zero, zero, but my next point is no longer pi over two comma one, it's 0.582. So I can see that the period has shifted dramatically. So if I make the period, I'm sorry, if I make B2, the period is now pi rather than two pi, again, because I'm dividing by one, and we can see what those five key points are. Uh, if I make it smaller, like 0.5, I can see now that four pi is the uh, is the period, because again, we take two pi, the original period, and divide it by one half, which we multiply by the reciprocal to get four pi. Back to one for B. If I have a C value with a B value of one, that's literally just going to shift those values over and over and over and over. Whereas the uh, C with a B value, so let's make B two. Now it's taking that graph that is compressed a little bit because the period is smaller and moving the points there. And then of course D just moves it straight up 
straight down. So if you want to give yourself a headache, press play on all of them at the same time. I don't suggest doing that. But you get the idea. Desmos can be used to visualize whatever needs to be visualized. Uh, and you can, you know, go from there, figure out how all of these uh, transformations work on your own. And of course, we could replace that with cosine as well and do the same. Modeling with sine and cosine. I wanted to end with an application with mathematical modeling. Now, in your textbook, they use this exact same example, uh, but they take you through how to find any of these values manually. So what we're dealing with is a table that shows the depths of in feet of the water at the end of a dock every two hours from midnight to noon, where t equals zero corresponds to midnight. They want us to use a trigonometric model trigonometric function to model the data and then find when a boat can safely dock if it needs at least 10 feet of water. So again, in your textbook, they take you through how to find the amplitude by hand, how to find everything by hand. Um, I'm going to show you how to use Desmos because as we know, when we as people are drawing a best fit line, we don't do as good of a job as a computer can do. So I'm going to show you this way if your homework mean makes you go through and find each of those things you can find those examples in your text so here's the data and I'm looking at a cosine function here and the reason I'm looking at cosine is because it doesn't go through at zero zero now it doesn't go through at zero one either but again uh, it's going up right away now if you're not sure if it's going to be cosine or sine you can certainly try both remember when we're modeling I'm replacing f of x with y1, y1 because that's what's in the table, and x1 here. Oh, fabulous. Let's try that again. Let's try x1 and then replace it with y1. And make sure it doesn't delete my data. There we go. Now we can see the R squared value here is one, and that means it fits the model exactly. So the way that they're showing you in the textbook is great, but it's the values are a little bit off. For instance, for amplitude, they used 5.6 uh, because they took 11.3 minus 0.1 uh, or minus 1.2, I don't remember what they subtracted, and then divided by two. So you get the idea that they're using these specific points as opposed to all of the data on the function. So R squared is equal to one means it fits the data exactly. So this is a great model to use. So if they ask for the model or the function, we can replace D with 5.622 or however many decimal places we need. A is 5.72, B is 0.483, and C is negative 1.97. The second question finds when can a boat safely dock? So really I can just put Y equals 10 and see that between 2.63 and 5.52 hours after midnight, so sometime between you know 2.40 something a.m. and 5. 30 a.m. is when a boat is going to be able to dock. Now, that's in the morning. If we need the afternoon, uh, we would have to come over here and find in the afternoon 15, which would be like 3, sometime past 3.30, to 18, which is sometime past 6.30. So between 3.30 and 6.30-ish, and obviously you can compute that to... Um, minutes if you would like. But we get the idea that's how we can use that model in this particular question. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at the graphs of the other trigonometric functions.